Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, even though National Nursing Nurses Week has just passed in, in May, we want to keep the gratitude going by thanking all the nurses in our country for the important work that you do. And we are going to cover a variety of issues with our special guests, Jonathan Webb, Chief Executive Officer of the Association of Women's Health, Obstetrics, and Neonatal Nurses, Kay Judge, Executive Director of the American Nurses Foundation, and Nancy McRae, CEO of the Emergency Nurses Association. So thank you all for joining us, Jonathan, Kay, Nancy. It's just great to see you. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. Well, it's, it's, it, I'm so excited, I have to tell you, and, and I want to, uh, to uh, have a special call out to my Aunt Janice, who is a nurse, who is just an amazing person and has basically been a mainstay of our family. She is an amazing, amazing contributor to so many people with a heart that is just so big and so instructive to, to me in my life. Um, I want to just sort of set, set you up, and we're going to go over uh, to you, Jonathan. Um, I'm going to set you up with, with this sort of uh, quote. It's, it's really interesting. Um, when you look at career satisfaction, intention to leave jobs, mental health, and well-being issues among registered nurses, they they really are, are fairly significant. And I want to quote the um, uh, AMN Healthcare Survey of Registered Nurses uh, uh, that was done by... Um, and there's a quote by Chief Clinical Officer, Dr. Cole Edmondson. The health of our nation is tied directly to the health of the nursing workforce. So let's let, let's talk about that health of the nursing workforce, Jonathan. How do you see it? And, and how do you see this sort of the state of affairs in the profession today? Well, thank you for the question and the, the space for dialogue. And, and thank you to your, your aunt for her, her service in the nursing industry. Um, I think it's a really uh, interesting question and, and on top of our discussion. Uh, I'll first and foremost say that I think nurses are probably, in my opinion, one of the most passionate um, professions in, um, in the nation. Um, and because of that, I think they sacrifice a lot on behalf of their patients. Um, as the, I, I think they're quarterbacks of care. They're connecting the doctors and provide other providers with their families and communities they engage with. So they're directly related to, to, to the provision of care in a meaningful way. And um, uh, they, they do this in a very selfless and passionate uh, and uh, sacrificial way. The challenge with that is I think that when we have called on them to respond to many crises, but most recently to the COVID pandemic, we have not always uh, equipped them uh, to, to do their best work as a, a holistically. Um, during that pandemic, the nurses were nurses that, that we work with were called into action in a, in a, in a real uh, in a real way, um, and asked to to put themselves and their families um, at uh, great risk. Um, and they did that without complaining, um, without having the appropriate equipment, and sometimes the appropriate training um, to 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 do that. Uh, we we did not, as a nation, in my opinion, also support them from a, a, a mental and emotional health. All the with with all of the things I'm I'm, I'm talking about from a sacrifice and, and loss and things they're seeing, having to say equip them well and, or have them, uh, give them the space to process that. I also don't think as a nation, um, we have um, uh, invested in them in, in a meaningful way. During that time, I completely understand the need to support and bring travel nurses in to help to, to, to support the shortage that we're seeing. But in some ways it created a, this, this weird dichotomy of those individuals who are already within the nursing system standing alongside their sister and brother nurses with, with disparate pay grades. So I think there were- Let me just, were, let me just uh, describe travel. Could you just de de define the term travelers? So travelers, you have nurses who are not connected to the hospital, who are brought in from outside of the health system to fill a need, um, often at four, five, 10 times the, the pay rate um, than their sister and brother nurses are working alongside. Um, so, so what you're saying is that the system itself is so thin that during this type of an event like COVID, that you end up with people who, first of all, because they're so much on the front line, they're not protected, that the staffing is not organized in a way that allows for a systematic response. 
And so what you end up with is people who are, you have a sort of a chaotic situation that people are kind of on their own to navigate an emotional situation and danger to personal endangerment situation right. where they're just sort of left at, to their own devices, right? That's exactly it. I think what you end up with is, is really passionate professionals who end up burnt out. Um, and then you'll start to, they'll continue to do their job because that's what they're called to do. But then you start to see some of this reflected in the data that you're citing about workplace satisfaction, interest in maybe considering other careers, things of that nature. And then when you add on top of that, what we've seen recently, um, not just recently, but it's gotten more attention recently around the workplace violence that nurses are experiencing when people coming into hospital settings and threatening or putting nurses in, in situations where their lives are in danger. All these things are factors that contribute, I think, to what the report is seeing. Uh, Kate, could you talk a little bit about some of these topics as well and, and what your uh, constituents are, are feeling and how that experience, traumatic as it was, has resulted in different attitudes and approaches that are set to address some of the topics that, that Jonathan highlights? Yeah, great, great question and great topics and great comments, Jonathan. I think that what we've seen nationally as we've surveyed nurses um, really since the beginning of the pandemic is that, um, as Jonathan said, nurses want to show up. They do show up. But the level of chaos, the level of trauma um, that was uh, accentuated in the pandemic. I mean, you have to remember, a nurse's job is hard. It was, long, it was hard long before the pandemic, but it just got that much harder. And we've seen them cope with extraordinary levels of stress, um, frustration. Um, we consistently see, and we have a new survey coming out, we've partnered with McKinsey, that they continue to be stressed. They're less stressed than they were. There are There is some normalization now, but they're not feeling like they've gotten the support of their employers. Um, they are looking for more flexibility. I think that people traveling is going to be a new reality for the, for the workforce, and we have to embrace that. L nurses are looking for flexibility. Nurses are looking for meaning. They're looking for variety. And, you know, I've been around nurses for 30 years. I'm not a nurse. I'm just so lucky to have been around them for 30 years. And I, this is a sea change for what people um, can expect. And, and I think we've got the public looking at nursing and understanding that the economy rests on healthcare and healthcare really rests upon the expertise of nurses. They are, they are committed, they are passionate, but they are experts in understanding the kind of care that we need and really being the safety for all of us who are both in acute care and in primary care. So I think that, that what we're seeing is a, a, we're at this, this inflection point. We have never seen the sense of um, my well-being um, is really at risk in my job before. That's what they're reporting consistently. You know, always, always nurses have, have struggled with, do we have enough nurses and, and other colleagues in the care environment to take care of the right patients? But now they're really putting together that level of stress um, and the sense that I've, I'm, I'm compromising my very own life and ability to thrive. And that's not a fair thing for us to ask nurses to do. We don't want tired nurses. We don't want stressed nurses. We want them at the best that they can be taking care of us and our children and our parents and our grandparents. And Nancy McCray, your, your constituents, the, uh, the Emergency Nurses Association, your constituents are sort of by definition, you're in the midst of trauma in emergency rooms. But there's a difference because just being in that environment in the past wasn't necessarily unsafe personally, but during COVID, it was just presence, just physical presence becomes a traumatic, worrying issue about what you're going to bring home to your family, particularly in the early days of COVID. How do people cope and, and how do you see changes that that have come to fruition or that where consciousness has been raised about necessary changes that are required in the future? Uh, for the work that your emergency nurses do? 
Yeah, really appreciate the opportunity to, you know, support the conversation and really think laid out, you know, all the issues really well um, and can't underscore enough the the statement of, you know, the health of our nation is definitely tied to the health of the, the nursing workforce. So, you know, like you said, in emergency nursing specifically, you know, they they do thrive on chaos. We talk about the chaotic environment that is the at the core of what happens in emergency departments, um, but they're trained for that. And so, you know, and prepared and supported. And so that really is the fundamental aspect of emergency nursing is you may not know everything that's going to walk through the door, but you have really good systems and support and training in place uh, that, that gives you those protocols to follow. And certainly, as we've all said, uh, there were no protocols in the pandemic. And so everything has changed in so many ways. And so certainly, uh, not knowing what you're dealing with, they very much in emergency nursing specifically, very much on the front line, uh, not supported in the early days. Nobody knew how to support. And so in fairness to that, it wasn't known, um, not only risking their own personal safety without even thinking about it. Um, but what we're seeing now is is um, in many ways that downstream effect of it, not only their personal safety and that passion for them to just keep going, but what they saw, what I hear them describe in terms of what they saw and endured day in, day out of the volume of patients that were coming, that they had no um, options or care for them, the family members that had no support for what was going on, the amount of death um, that they saw was really, really traumatic. And right now we're seeing that very much contributing to a lot of the uh, workforce issues we're seeing specifically in emergency nursing. We're seeing the rate of emergency nursing burnout even higher than the overall um, nursing workforce that I know, Kate, you shared you know, your research and continue to, to look at that. Really important to see. Uh, we're seeing that probably you know, 10 times higher specifically within the emergency nursing space. And so the need, the opportunity, the imperative uh, really is there for us collectively, as well as certainly our organization to, to look at all different ways that we can improve the environment overall, the work environment for emergency nurses to help create a health, healthier uh, workforce. Could you, could you all describe a little bit for somebody who doesn't know as well, the, um, the culture of, of nursing, does it allow for self-care and for periodic organized um, uh, transitional experiences that will bring down the, the level of tension and trauma. You see in, for example, law enforcement, um, a tradition of sort of setting aside personal trauma. You see in, in, um, in, in um, firefighters that, that idea of setting aside, you see that in the military. These are traditionally male-dominated um, uh, uh, professions where traditional attitudes of, of masculinity can, can sort of infect people's um, behaviors. How is, it, does the nursing profession, Jonathan, and then Kate and, and uh, Nancy deal with this idea that people who are living within a traumatic environment uh, need some self-care and need a break? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a great question. Um, I, I would say uh, I, I had the, the ability to travel to spend some time with a lot of my members, but also in their healthcare systems. And in terms of the, the structures that exist to allow for the self-care, I think it varies from place to place. Um, there are some institutions that do it really well, carving out time and like quiet rooms and places for people to go to kind of decompress. There's always a great what I've seen is a great culture of camaraderie um, at, the, at the health institutions and, and clinics and, and sites. So there's a lot of that sort of um, iron sharpening iron and people being able to lean on each other um, for, for support. But the actual structural place things that exist to allow them to self to self care varies from, from, from site to site. So we, we do a great deal with our members to try to provide them with strategies, resources, education on how they can take some of that time um, and claim some of that time for themselves to to recharge their batteries because I, I like to say you can't pour from an empty cup. Um, so um, we we try to support them in that. To to the to the point about how different industries handle it, I do think that nurses um, do a really great job of compartmentalizing as they need to, um, but I also think they do it without losing humanity uh, because I think some of the experiences they've ex they they have encountered help them to be more empathetic and more engaging because of the things, the things that they've seen. It's just that they put themselves way at the back of the line as they are 
meeting the needs of their patients, which I think can be problematic for them individually, but it's what they've been called to do in the service of others. Just making sure they have time at some point to come back and refresh and recharge so they can be their, their best selves. Hey, Nancy, do you see a difference also between the nonprofit uh, uh, nursing sector and then the and for-profit settings? I mean, we've seen um, for-profit organizations take over the management of nurse uh, of emergency uh, rooms and and that that kind of thing. How do, how do you see uh, this this issue of self care? Well, I, I'll jump in on, on self care. It it is a standard that that nurses are are taught that they need to take care of themselves. You know, put the oxygen mask on first. But it's it hasn't been in my experience embedded in the culture. And the, the quiet rooms are the first ones to go to get repurposed when you need another room for a patient, right? It, it, it's sort of expendable. Um, we, the American Nurses Association, my, my colleague organization, we've started something called Healthy Nurse, Healthy Nation before the pandemic, five years ago. We've done so much more around wellness and well-being. And, and we partnered actually with ENA right away um, as the pandemic started. But getting nurses to actually take the time to take care of themselves is a real challenge. I will say that I'm holding on great hope to generational shift. So my kids' generations don't want to sacrifice their health for their job. And so I think that that might be a real motivator for the industry to shift, whether it's for-profit or not-for-profit. Um, and, and for leadership, this is going to be a challenge for nursing leadership, for nursing leadership to say, um, especially in an environment where there are not enough nurses, we know that 100,000 nurses have left the profession. We're looking at shortages of, of various predictive amounts. So we're going to have to figure out, even with less nurses, how to change the environment so that self-care isn't dependent just upon the nurse to do it, but for the environment to create something that is a place where people want to go to work. If we don't have environments where people want to go to work, they, they won't work there. And then we'll, we'll all, we're all going to pay the price. So we're beginning to really shift from helping individual nurses as we did in the pandemic with financial stipends when they were furloughed and they were sick and they weren't getting paid and, and mental health programs that we'll continue to offer to really look at how do we invest and reimagine the nursing space and the environment? Because we can, you know, there's lots of money that's going into education of nurses. Let's bring more people in. But if, it, if it, it's an untenable situation, they can't, they can't stay there. And um, we, we all have to fix that. The public, um, associations, um, the nursing profession, but, but really the care models that are delivering these environments right now for nurses. Nancy? Uh -huh. Yeah, no, I would, you know, certainly add on to the, you know, overall, the, the system, right? And Jonathan, like what you said, it, it just, it varies widely. Uh, and so totally see that. And so continuing the imperative to um, kind of address it overall from, you know, an overall healthy work environment, like UK, you know, ENA has been focused on healthy work environment for many, many years, and it, it affects multiple layers, including individuals. So education resources, training tools for individual nurses to learn how to certainly uh, take care of themselves and each other, but also in the system, such a key piece of it. And obviously the systems continue to change. So Mark, you know, for profit, profit, um, in our view, doesn't really matter. It is about the system, no matter how it is funded. It is about taking care of your workforce. And so the system needs to support that in new ways, ways that hasn't been happening. And so continuing to look at uh, solutions in that regard. And then obviously at, at, at the public policy um, space as well, continuing to find ways to support uh, legislative and policy changes that will continue to address uh, system wide self-care for nurses that ultimately help create a healthier uh, work environment and then workforce, um, you know, and patient care ultimately, which, which is what everybody's passionate about. Well, it's interesting. We've just done uh, two, two uh, polls. Uh, one shows that um, three quarters of the people who are attending this live uh, through the Zoom uh, webinar are either are nurses themselves or have family members who are nurses. What was interesting is in the second poll, we talked about what do you think is critical in terms of support for nurses today. And we've got a number of different options, but one option that got 100% response is worksite mental and physical health resources. Do you all believe that that's about job one in terms of, of helping nurses uh, stay in, or are there other areas that you think are are more important than, than that whole idea of self-care? Uh, Nancy? 
I, you know, it's not an easy answer for me because I don't think right. it's jo- job one. And so um, I certainly think it's fundamental at the baseline of it all. But just providing those aren't enough if the system and the people don't fully support the people in it taking advantage of those. So it becomes this, you know, double edged sword, so to speak. We've seen and heard, you know, places where, well, we provide that so everything should be okay. But if it's on your off hours or it's not supported at the time when maybe you need it most, particularly in the ED, when, you know, certainly trauma, um, as you're trying to de escalate from that. Um, it needs to be supported at the system level, not just providing it isn't enough. So it's attitudinal as well, right? It's it's basically having it permeate everything that you do from the planning and budgeting that you do to what happens in the moment on the ground and then in the aftermath. It's the whole, it's the whole shebang, right? Absolutely. Thank yeah. You. We've, we've seen we've seen um, nurses consistently say that they, there are EAPs, right, employee assistance programs, but they're not by and large taking advantage of them, sometimes because they feel that there's retribution. Sometimes, as Nancy said, like it's during my work time, I can't take time to go to lunch. Everything. Yeah. Um, I can, how can I how can I process that? So I think it's not a checkbox. We've got to go. We really have to move beyond the. Um, and we experienced this in the pandemic, you know, working with ENA and critical care nurses like we built things. But just building them isn't enough for them to come if they aren't really designed in a way that is going to fit into their extraordinarily busy life. You know, they want short pieces and and we're going to have to figure out how to deliver that. But but mostly that they are not mentally taxed and exhausted is is top of the list. But the way to do that isn't just by helping them cope with an impossible situation. We have to actually change the situation they walk into every day. That's what has to be the imperative for policy, for organizations, for consumers, um, and certainly for employers. We know that the C-suite it just is, is, is constantly talking about how do we solve this nursing problem? And it's, it's how do we engage nurses to help us reimagine the work environment so that they can come and they can do different things. We were just out, you asked a question about, about um, for profits. We were just out with one of our grantees in our reimagining nursing program um, out in Phoenix. And you have nurses who are doing, they're, they're certainly still working in acute care, but then they're also doing this really innovative home care where they're going in and really having the time and the ability to connect with patients in a way that is not not consumed by a pretty fractured environment where they work um, and they're thriving. These nurses are so happy. And so we've, we've got are these on the for-profit side or the nonprofit side, or this is, this is, this is a for-profit organization that we're, that we're supporting, but it, it's a lesson that all nonprofits can learn from, right? How do we, how do we give nurses the ability to, to operate in their environment, make their environment better, but then maybe have them have the flexibility to do some other things, to walk into somebody's home and say, let me have the time to really talk to you about what's going on with your care, help you sort through your medication, make sure you're safe, talk to your family. It's amazing when you when you meet nurses who have the opportunity to do that, they are incredibly resilient and thriving. Now I would just quickly add to that, Mark, that uh, I think it's very difficult to just have it um, the, the response hone in on the, the programmatic solution of having resources available. I think it's extremely important but I think to echo what Kate and Nancy said, I think it needs to be more of a systemic solution, one that's based on valuing your team member, valuing your employee. So creating a system where people feel comfortable to, to take advantage of those things without retribution. I think having a, having equitable pay, pay that recognizes their contributions in the healthcare environment, um, um, setting up, um, um, uh, allowing training. That's well, one of the, the stats that, that Kate talked about was 100,000 nurses leaving the workforce. So that means new people being called into, into roles that they may not have been experienced with doing before and are now being thrust into that into that position to do that. What sort of training is being provided to support them in, in, in meeting those new those, those new um, responsibilities? Well, simple respect as well, right? I mean, respect. Part, of, part of our healthcare system's problem is that we're so hierarchical. It doesn't escape my notice that I walk into a healthcare setting and the doctors are called doctors and the nurses are called by their first names. Right. Right. I mean, that in and of itself uh, ends up having a, a, an issue because if you are 
sitting around planning how you're going to manage this uh, continuum of care that you're providing, if you have a tilted hierarchy, then that tilt will end up favoring the priorities of the people who are hierarchically above others, right? Whereas the nurses are taking care of me as a person, right? I want that nurse to have a voice. Um, how do we change that kind of a culture? Are people getting together? Um, are the uh, doctor, nurse, and, and other staff divisions beginning to break down? And are people talking to each other in healthcare settings in the post-COVID world in a way that they hadn't previously, Kate? I think they are, and I think they aren't. So certainly we are seeing groups work together. We worked with a number of, of nursing and non-nursing groups during the pandemic to look at solutions. Um, but there, you know, there's money at play. There are issues of authority and autonomy at play. Those are complicated issues. Um, I think what, what we did see in the pandemic is there was so much change that was possible quickly. Um, I think you need to have that urgency again. Uh, so, you know, I know many physicians and, and pharmacists who are all about the team and helping it work. But sometimes we see on a national level, things still break down um, between doctors and nurses and, you know, what, what is quality care? And, you know, for my 30 years, I have no question that nurses are delivering extraordinarily high levels of, of care with out, outcomes that, that match um, in, in primary care physicians. Um, we need to, we kind of need to move on. And in some ways, many parts of the world have moved on and said, this is a great solution. Let's have more of that. And that's an opening for something better in the future. Nancy, what kind of changes do you think are required in this vaunted healthcare system that we have in the United States? What 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 shift will provide better care for patients and a better quality of life and greater retention for uh, for your constituents? I mean, I think, Jonathan, you teed that up really well. I think I would echo um, and just repeat it. I think that's really important to lay out all of the different issues, but it is around um, valuing, valuing your team, each other and your team. It, 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 comes with, it starts with respect. It ends with respect. Uh, equitable pay is clearly at it. Training. Uh, safety. One thing we hadn't touched on and, you know, early on mentioned, uh, you need to work in a safe environment and it isn't in a lot of places. And that, again, is another systemic um, solution that is needed to provide a safe working environment for our nurses. And many of them are in, in situations where there's a lot of vulnerability and um, we need to make sure that we are protecting uh, the, the people who are serving there. And, and so a really important piece of the solution is, is creating a safe workplace for our nurses. Um, it really, again, gets to the system. So it's not an easy answer, but it really, you know, gets to, it is, it, I, I do believe that, you know, certainly within emergency nursing, the emergency physicians and the emergency nurses all understand and, um, and see the challenges and the issues. It's how we get to the solutions that continues to be the challenges. So we want to keep looking at all avenues for ways to build those solutions. And Jonathan, let me give you the last word. What kind of change are, uh, uh, should we be thinking about to improve the whole field for nurses to make sure that my kids are really considering this as a professional choice, a rational professional choice, either in the emergency room or in some other role. Um, wh what do we do? So I, I would echo all the things that, that Nancy mentioned earlier, the systemic valuing of our team um, and, and all the things that, that contribute to that. A, a couple of things that have not been mentioned yet, though, is I would say one of the things we worked on is providing a, a, a standard around what certain staffing levels will look like because the other things you have is that you have nurses spread really thin. So having part of that value is making sure that there's a standard level of, of, of staffing to support the care. And the last thing we haven't talked about is ways that we made um, intentionally look to diversify our perinatal work, work, workforce uh, because there's opportunities to help to support this nursing workforce um, shortage by making sure it's diverse and reaching uh, across uh, to in different demographic um, areas to help to, to make sure um, care is continuing to be delivered equitably, but also um, uh, with, with support from community members and individuals who represent those who are um, uh, they're providing care for. So I think that's, that's the way that we actually get to a place where we are valuing and supporting our nurses by starting with them 
And I, and I think this, this one piece, when we, when we look to redefine and design systems, really needing to engage the end users in the conversation. So as we're starting to adjust and build a system, that can't be done without the voices of nurses at the table to make sure what design truly meets their needs now and in the future. As in so many other things, just listening to each other and showing respect, true respect, not lip service respect, but true respect, meaning that you change systems because of input that you receive from different members of the team having different roles, very important roles in the continuum of care is so important. Jonathan Webb, the Chief Executive Officer of the Association of Women's Health, Obstetrics, and Neonatal Nurses, Kate Judge, Executive Director of the American Nurses Foundation, and Nancy McRae, Emergency uh, Nurses Association CEO. Thank you so much for sharing the work that you do. Please thank your nurses. Please thank your funders. Please thank your staff, because our health, my health, depends on you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.